Hello and welcome to So What You're Saying Is. I'm Peter Whittle. Now, do you ever get the sensation that the world is going mad and you're the only sane person? Uh, we've sort of talked about that kind of problem on this channel uh, on and off for the past two or three years. It certainly does sometimes feel that way. Uh, in which case, uh, there's a new book out which might well interest you. It is called uh, Have We All Gone Mad? What, why Groot Think is Rising and How to Stop It. Here's the book, it's available now. And I'm very pleased that the author, Dr. Jerome Booth, who's an economist and entrepreneur, is with me now. Thank you very much for coming uh, in. Um, first things first, actually, if I may, yep. Jerome. Um, group think. Yep. Can we have a few definitions here? I think I know what you mean by, the, but, and I've read the book, but, but can you explain what you Well, group think, the term was I invented um, uh, after, uh, uh, in the 70s, and yes. it really referred to small group um, misdirection, where people believe something that's basically fictitious, yes, and nobody challenges it, yes. And since then, the uh, management consultant industry has been using this and has uh, uh, improved board decisions yeah. by having challenges um, and, and 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 so on and so forth. But what this book is about is really mass groupthink. So what I'm saying is that groupthink isn't merely a small group issue it can occur with millions of people thinking something that's completely nonsense yes. and not backed by uh, uh, you know, data or, or, or if you like, it's, it's wrong in some fundamental way. And Irrational then? Well, yes, irrational doesn't only starts to cover it. Right. Um, this is, it's, when it gets to a, to a large number of people, if it's obviously false, then you have to have more than irrationality to support it. It actually has to be defended. And for that, you need a moral argument, whereby if you agree with uh, this group think, you're virtuous. Right. But if you don't agree, you're not merely wrong, you're mm -hmm. evil. Mm -hmm. And there are defenses against those who would challenge the group think. So this is, um, you know, fear is quite an important element to disciplining uh, group think, mass group think. And it's remarkably common. So what I'm saying in the book is that this is a function of human psychology. And the whole first chapter is about psychology. We're much less rational than we think we are. And in fact, bizarrely, the more educated, erudite, intelligent are more prone to groupthink than the rest of us. Actually, before you go on, this is a fascinating point which sort of like dawned on me a while ago. Um, but it see, does seem to me that what people often call, for example, the liberal metropolitan elites, things like that, um, Essentially, they are, as you say, they they are far more prone to fashion in thinking, yes. aren't they? They're far more prone to being to sticking together. So, you know, and yet somehow they accuse everybody else. Well, of actually, one way to express this, which is quite visual, which is Jonathan Haidt's idea, is you can think of our subconscious like an elephant, and the elephant goes wherever it wants, yeah. and our conscious selves are sitting on top of the elephant. And the more intelligent and educated we are, the more we convince ourselves that we are telling the elephant where to go, when in fact we're not. Mm. And, that, and that, if you like, and you add in a lot of hubris yes. and power and lots of people telling you uh, that you're right, and you believe it, and you convince others on their elephants mm. uh, that they're right as well. So you combine the psychology with a couple of other things. One is new forms of communication. And, you know, we had huge uh, uh, violence and, and disruption when, for example, the printing press was invented. Mm. Uh, throughout history, there are many examples of this. We've now got, with the internet and social media, um, lots of benefits, mm. uh, but also it's a very new technology. It requires different reactions, and our Stone Age brains can't cope. And one of the consequences is that it's radically changed people's networks, and that network change is much more powerful than we think. Mm. And it's made for lots of benefits, as I said, but also greater isolation for some people and certainly intolerance. Mm. And um, you combine that then with the psychology. And in addition, um, postmodernist memes, some very vicious uh, uh, sort of anti-science thinking, which has been with us uh, uh, since the end of the war, really. I mean, it goes much further. Hegel is a particular uh, problem, if you like. But um, that has combined uh, and come, well, that's spilled out of universities, and that's uh, combined with these other things to form a whole lot, a lot of behaviour patterns which seem to be completely crazy. And 
what I, why I wrote this book was I had various ideas and I could see how they were interlinked, mm. but that people weren't seeing those linkages. So this is a book which um, I've written to try and explain easily how these various things are linked and how you know, mental health issues or you know, people's extreme views on one thing or other are actually uh, linked. And also how you don't need a conspiracy theory to explain this. It doesn't mean to say there aren't people who conspire, but you really don't need it. And you don't even need people who are subject to groupthink to, to realise it. In fact, groupthink is much most of, more effective when people have no idea that they're, they're subject to this groupthink. So um, it's very vulnerable. This is the other thing. So at the end of the book, I'm trying to say, well, how do you identify it? It's not that difficult mm. uh, to mm. identify, to mm. be honest. And it's quite, it, at least in theory, simple to look at ways that we can challenge it, and not just as individuals, but also institutions, our, our policy makers, you know, there are things that they can do uh, with institutions to ensure, in a nutshell, that there's an appropriate challenge. Mm. Can you give us an example? I mean, I can think of some immediately that rise, uh, come, to, come to my mind. For example, uh, take the pandemic, take mm -hmm. COVID. Um, if you were one of the people, and there were many of us actually, who sort of thought, I feel that I'm completely outside. People seem to be behaving in this extraordinary way. Um, I don't know what your views were on the pandemic, but mm -hmm. that to me seemed to be a good example of groupthink, whereby basically people wore masks, they, they socially distanced, they did all of this stuff, whilst at the same time feeling there was something not quite right about this. Do you think that is an example of groupthink? Well, I think, let's be specific, we're talking about lockdown. Yeah. COVID is a... You know, is oh, yes, yes, of course. The lockdown policy is yeah. where the contention lies. And I do think there were some serious mistakes made, particularly once we had worked out some of the basics uh, of the disease. Um, and it was quite clear that there was a, a disciplining of those who disagreed with the consensus. And that is a classic symptom of groupthink. When you have uh, a stop to de debate, when it is the moral imperative is to not discuss something, that's a sure sign that there's grouping yes. going on. Um, the other interesting thing is that fear was very clearly mm. an instrument of policy. Well, you, fear is to, actually in the, in, right, yes, right on the cover of your book here. Lots in of words of on the cover, yes. Fear. No, because, I mean, that, sorry, I interrupted you there. Yeah, no, that, but, but it does seem to be the case that uh, y you, you make the point in the book as well that when structures of what you might call uh, agreed values and everything, when they are disintegrating, then groupthink has much more of a chance because it can be based on such things as fear. I think fear has been with us a long time and it's been used as an as a element of policy for a long time. What's particularly, and this is another element of the book that comes into it, what's particularly worrying is that not only do we now have um, you know, many, if you like, nudge units, uh, in government using fear with without an ethical framework. Mm. This is the point. I'm, mm. I'm actually in favour of you know, the nudge techniques as an economist. I can see huge benefits. But if there's no um, uh, you know, proper ethical framework to say, well, you shouldn't be you know, causing fear, um, there, there's, there's, a, there's a downside. And the downside, by the way, the whole of one of my chapters, chapter two, is about um, uh, uh, social capital. Mm. If we don't trust each other, fear has this, uh, it erodes trust. Without trust, you get disillusioned with uh, government as well as all sorts of other problems right. uh, in terms of dealing with everybody else in the community and, and nationally. And that itself is a direct threat to our democracy. And so there are major side, negative side effects from some of these policies that have been implemented, including lockdown policies. And, um, but fear is, uh, has been with us a long time, just as groupthink has. What's an additional problem is that you've now got big tech uh, using yeah. using uh, uh, different techniques to try and also uh, create predictability in consumer behaviour, mm. and we have now uh, um, you know continuous automated algorithms doing experiments on people. Um, it's over ten years ago mm. that uh, a very annoyed uh, um, a member of the American public walked into a Target uh, store. That's a, a brand mm. big, big mm. brand in the states. Uh, demanding to see the manager because uh, the store had been uh, selling uh, or been promoting pregnancy materials for his teenage daughter. 
uh, despite the fact that the daughter never having bought anything from yes. Target. Yeah. And what neither the, the manager or the father understood it initially was that, of course, she was pregnant and the algorithms had worked it out just right. by what she was looking at on the internet. And that Target had... This is 10 years ago. That's, yeah. that's history. Yeah. We're much more advanced now. So what these companies want is to have predictable behavior and not just predictable, but behavior that they can actually change because it's a very small step from one to the other. If you've got big tech doing that, uh, and, and particularly with things like our news feeds, um, we lack, we start to lack objectivity. We start to reduce our ability to challenge uh, uh, accepted views. Mm -hmm. That builds groupthink. If you, in addition to that, have fear coming out of government policy and other government policies trying to nudge us, that also stops our ability to challenge Mm -hmm. uh, uh, accepted wisdom mm -hmm. and those things combine with with no effective challenge to them to create uh, very good conditions for mm -hmm. groupthink to thrive and I should go right the way back to say you know this is not a new uh, debate in politics um, two and a half thousand years ago Plato thought that the most important question in politics was who should be leader yes he thought himself yeah. despite the fact that at yeah. least nine of his own students went on to become tyrants and all the rest of it uh, he thought the wise person, him, should be uh, the choice. Yeah. And, and it was the followers of Socrates who said, no, that's the wrong first question. The first question is, because whoever you, you elect as leader is a gamble. Mm -hmm. The correct question in politics is, how do you hold power to account? Yeah. And we still, two and a half thousand years ago, have this, uh, um, if you like, tension between two, these two questions. And we are in a situation where uh, when you have uh, uh, government policies which shuts down debate, that reduces the ability to hold anybody to account, and then you're taking a gamble. Because maybe policy would be right, maybe it would be wrong, but that, in a way that's not the important question. The, most, in question, the most, in, most important question is, was that policy properly mm. arrived at, mm. and, and was it challenged appropriately? Is it legitimate? Uh, if we don't uh, hang on to that, we risk losing our democracy thing is, though, to you, Jeremy, is that you talk about policy there. Uh, was this policy right? Are they accountable? I would say that as, as most people now experience groupthink, it actually comes not from policy areas. No. Nope. Um, it comes from all our institutions. I mean, I, I don't need to go through them all, but there is a sort of sense in which if you step out of line, you know, that somehow or other... Well, first of all, you won't be fired, but, but it won't be a pleasant experience, right? Or you could indeed be fired. We spoke to a lot of people uh, um, who have indeed experienced that. But whether it's museums or academia, all of these areas, there appears to be a total a convergence of views on certain things. It's not actually about policy, is it? It's not about government. No, but policy, policy is important because policy sets the ability to have free speech and to have a proper challenge mm. uh, to ideas. So what we're talking, uh, another parallel of what's going on may be McCarthyism in 1950s America, where if, as long as you, if mm. you like, obeyed the rules, it was all perfectly legal, you, you might say, well, why bother? But of course, you step out of line, mm. uh, or you uh, uh, have uh, sympathies with some of the policies of people who are clearly out of line, and you are in trouble. Mm. And so there is a slippery slope. You know, either you have liberal democracy or you get some form of tyranny eventually. Mm. And it just, without checks, you know, the, the, the thing just gets worse. So we have to, you know, we have to constantly fight for our freedoms. And that does affect things which on the surface are not policy at all. They're nothing to do with politics. They are mm. cultural. They are to do with institutions in every form. And um, the, the whole, what I'm trying to say in the book is how these things are related. Um, in a way, the, the central part of the book is a defense of the scientific method. Mm. Uh, this is a defense mm. of Karl mm. Popper in particular mm. against the idiocies of, of sort of postmodernism. Uh, this idea that we all have our own truth, which taken to its conclusion means, well, there is no objective truth. Mm. And uh, I can't, I don't say I know what the objective truth is, but um, I am saying there is one. Mm. Uh, it's a good working assumption, at least. Um, I think we have far too many people who, because they are, uh, frightened, uh, they want to know certainty. They want certainty. Yeah. They want truth. Yes. And truth is not the same as science. Science is based on scepticism. Mm. It's based on having hypotheses which are testable and can fall down at any moment. And it's only through 
the process of testing and having uh, um, assumptions behind those found to be false, that eventually you get to the very uncomfortable reality that one of your uh, assumptions, which you've taken up to this point to be self-evident, is actually wrong. Mm. And it's, it's a very common mistake to think that somehow scientists are different to the rest of us and that they are a font of wisdom. That's not, not true. Mm, mm, um, mm. Actually, if I may quote, yes, from, me too. From, if I can find it quickly, from uh, Richard Feynman, the, the physicist, um, who, uh, 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 as you know, a very, f- very uh, uh, well-known person. So he, Richard says, uh, science is the belief in the ignorance of experts. When someone says science teaches such and such, he is using the word incorrectly. Science doesn't teach anything. Experience teaches it. If they say to you, science has shown such and such, you might ask, how does science show it? How did the scientists find out? How? What? Where? It should not be science has shown, but this experiment, this effect has shown. And you have as much right as anyone else upon hearing about the experiments, but be patient and listen to all the evidence, to judge whether a sensible conclusion has been arrived at. Right. We're, we're in a world where that ethic of, of science is, is under uh, uh, threat. And it's, there's, a, there's a parallel with journalism. So a good scientist, an objective scientist, uh, is, is ethically required to produce all evidence rele- re- mm. relevant to their hypothesis, not mm. merely the ones that fit. Mm-mm. And so a, and a successful lecture on a controversial issue might result in the brightest student coming to the front and saying, yes, but to the lecturer, but what's your view? Mm. That's, that's mm. good. That means yeah. they didn't give away a particular bias. In a similar way, if you can tell what the view of a journalist is, they're maybe doing commentary or something else, but it's not objective, mm. impartial journalism. Mm. And, and so what I'm saying is we, are, we have to be careful about the detail of how we challenge ideas and have institutions which are, to some way, unbiased. Mm. Another psychological problem, which, which is particularly problematic at the moment, is that um, we have a, a deep psychological need to reduce anxiety and uncertainty. Um, and having one big fear helps us cope with all the other little ones. Mm. It, it puts everything else in perspective. Mm. And up until the end of the Cold War, um, we had the potential you know, nuclear uh, Armageddon, and, and that sort of had that process. Since then, uh, we've had to have other things, that we, we need this catastrophic thing. Climate change. And climate change is top of the I mean, I should add that you obviously are your chairman of the Global uh, yes. Warming Foundation, aren't you? Global Warming Policy Foundation. Yes. yes. Um, do you think that that is actually a good example of groupthink taking over? I think it's a very good example. I'm, I didn't specifically mention it no. in this book because there have been lots of other uh, uh, books talking about this, and it's a more general phenomenon, but it's an extremely good case. Where, where bizarrely, um, the, the, what I would call climate alarmists, um, mm. but the consensus view is based on science, whereas in fact it's not based on a consensus of science at all, if you actually look yeah. behind uh, 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 you know, the very basic uh, analysis beyond the, 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 the trite memes, you work out this is a very complex area. Uh, but whatever you think about the science, by the way, the policy appears to be completely mad. I mean, mm. it, doesn't, it doesn't achieve what it's meant to achieve. Mm. Uh, it, it, in many cases, makes things worse. So why is this the case? And why, does it, why is it uh, not easy to challenge it? And the reason is because it's, there's a moral argument behind it. Mm. This is not actually a, a rational discussion. Mm. This is a, a tribal issue. Mm. And values are our new tribal markers, by the way. Mm. You, know, you, you display certain values, and you're OK. You signal them. Um, and this has language is, is important to uh, 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 certain sort of people propagating this. Um, it's been less important to scientists for, for many years. This is a, I, I won't necessarily go into the detail, but there's the details of this in the book. Because, but, but basically, the use of words as building blocks uh, uh, for logical argument mm. is deeply flawed. Because yes. you can go in any direction you choose. And you end up with, with a, a way of looking at truth, which is determined by who's got the loudest voice yes. more than actually. Yeah. Uh, hard evidence. It's the opposite of science. And a lot of, uh, a lot of what's going on now is driven by this sort of moral argumentation, which is essentially um, uh, uh, the opposite of science, frankly. So yes, 
the policy of, of, of what we do about what little we know and the uncertain situation, which is very worrying, I, I don't disagree with that, that maybe we're causing a problem on a planetary scale. That's certainly something we should study a lot and look at. But given what we know, given where we are, the policy response appears to be completely uh, uh, ridiculous. Mm. But also universal. Uh, universal, uh, well, not I'm in China. No, no, not China. But not, you know if I mean. it was universal, it you might know, make more sense. You know, every yeah. single government, every single, in the West anyway, yes. you know, fully signed up to this, you know. Um, there are exceptions. Obviously, the, the, in the United States, there is a, a real debate. But you're right, in Europe uh, and Australia, other places, that, you know, whether you're right or left, you have to sign up to this agenda in order to get past any sort of uh, electorate at the moment. And... Um, that's deeply worrying. It is the fact that the Climate Change Act was passed, there was only five people voted against it and there was no debate. Mm. That tells you, well, if Parliament didn't actually debate an issue which might cost every household in the UK mm. several hundred thousand pounds, by the way, and still not, and it still mm. not produce the goods, why did Parliament not even debate it? Mm. That's I itself an indication that there was groupthink going on. Oh, yes, and also I, I remember there were a couple of uh, points made by various MPs uh, they, on the left and, and green, uh, but, but on the left, which seem to suggest that the government doesn't know what it, you know, the government doesn't know what it's doing, uh, you know, if it sort of goes, or if anyone goes against net zero, for example, or anything, uh, they are really going to pay for it at the, at the uh, you know, ballot box. And you sort of think, what world are you living in? I, I don't think I know anybody who would actually be swayed by those kind of thoughts about the environment actually well, you know you are if you're in that bubble definitely you can maybe see but it was extraordinary to actually think they really thought this would be a vote loser well well um, <laughs> this, again to quote Jonathan Haidt again um, uh, he he says well if you've got your moral view and evidence comes along if the evidence is consistent with your worldview you ask the question can I believe it mm. and the answer is always yes mm. and if the evidence is inconsistent contrary to your worldview, you ask a different question. You ask, do I have to believe it? And the right. answer is always no. Yeah, yes, yes. So what we're saying is we are an animal and our rationality has evolved to explain, to, to, to give ourselves stories, this is back to the elephant, to give ourselves stories to reduce our uncertainty about the world. The rationality, what we call rationality, has come afterwards. Right. So we decide what we want and then we come up with a story to justify it. So, the, so this is completely consistent, this pattern. And we consistently, nevertheless, deny uh, our own uh, senses. And, and we, 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 we think we're more rational than we are. Even, even if once we go through these arguments, we'll both go away thinking we're quite rational. Mm -hmm. And um, unfortunately, we're not. We need to be much humbler. And we need to you know, test, have our views, and everybody else's views, including mine and yours, mm -hmm. tested. And we need structures where that's possible. We're now living in a world, coming back to the sort of social media internet, where um, the geography, the local sense of community, where you can be assured of having random encounters with people. Many of the people you meet will have yeah. different views, and you have to cope with that. That is being eroded. And um, in particular, there's a problem with media. Um, I asked the question, well, if you were going to set up a, a modern uh, propaganda unit, as a government today, what would it look like? And one of the first things, to be most effective, propaganda has to be uh, not viewed as propaganda. It has to be seen as impartial. And there's a very real question about uh, much of our media, how much actually is it independent? Is it um, uh, impartial? Uh, a lot of journalists, I don't think, even understand the difference between mm. impartiality mm. and balance. They mm. think just by having the same airtime for mm. different arguments, that sound, somehow meets it. And it's not good enough. Um, so there's some coverage of that issue in, 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 in the book as well. Yes, I mean, it's, it's, it's rather like, you know, when you, when you say about, that, that's a very good point between, you know, like balance and impartiality. Um, you know, it, it are not the same things. Um, and I think, you know, when you, when you sort of look at, say, like something like the BBC, for example, they are convinced that they have the civilised view. I don't even think that they necessarily think they're indoctrinating people. They just think this is the kind of civilized of all civilized people. Mm. But it seems to me that, for example, in that instance, um, it's about what kind of position of power you are in. I mean, 
you know, whether it is the BBC or, as I said, museums mm -hmm. or the academic world, how much power you have to influence the direction of something. These, yes. you're talking about kind of small groups of we, people, even if they do yes. have. Yes, I would be very careful about talking about power, though. Right. So there's there's a whole tradition. This is the sort of Marxist view of the world that everything's about power, ah. and moreover about power between classes of people. Yes, and I reject that. Power is absolutely dominant in tyranny, but in free societies, it's much less important. There are other motives for people's behaviour mm -hmm. other than power relationships, which are driven by fear and mm -hmm. command. In tyrannies, absolutely true, but for our society, hopefully, and you know, it'll continue like this. Mm. Uh, it's one part of the issue, and it's challengeable. Mm. But we're fortunate enough to live in a society where we can challenge. If we choose not to, we will lose that, because uh, uh, democracy is a muscle. So, but but you're right that there is this um, uh, 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 issue about power. But but again, by using the word power, it's as if there's some sort of conspiracy, or, and this isn't the case. Most of the people in groupthink, most of the people working at BBC are very good, decent human beings, and they don't know that there's any groupthink affecting them. And uh, they're actually, if you give them the right incentive structure, you ask the right questions, they will change their view. Mm -hmm. So this is a solvable problem, um, and the real problem is the right questions aren't being asked at the right level. Mm -hmm. And so it is a governance issue in, for, for a media organisation like the BBC. There needs to be proper rigorous questioning by people not who are just roped in and then discounted but by people who really uh, believe in in a different version and yeah. have have the ability to say that in an intelligent way which is then listened to properly and and i think therefore i'm very hopeful i'm very much an optimist i think we can if you like uh, 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 resolve these problems um, the new thing as i said is is new communications technology and what I don't want is for us to have another 30 years war uh, where, you know, yeah. a third of the population gets killed and all the rest of it. I, it could be very painful. And what I'm really worried about is that in the transition uh, it, it, where we, you know, we move to a new set of communication technology, which is much you know, to our benefit in many senses, that we don't in the process lose democracy mm. and that we learn how to cope with that uh, new technology responsibly at the earliest possible Time. And that's what this book is about. It's basically saying, wake up. Wake up. But you're, as you say, you're optimistic. I'm optimistic that we, we, we will get around these problems. And we certainly don't need government to do it for us. Mm. Uh, we need government to, to behave themselves and stop thinking that they know better than everybody else. Mm. Um, clearly, they don't. And you talked about lockdown uh, policy. I think history will very clearly... Uh, but it make the point that, that it was lots of mistakes were made, not just by this government, but you know there were good things done as well. Yeah. Um, but 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 you know governments have no monopoly on on mm. being right about things, mm. and uh, the moment they fall into that error of thinking yeah. that they do, then you get mistakes. Well, look, um, it is you do offer suggestions in in the book, don't you? Um, how? Why Groupthink is Rising and How to Stop It. That is the subtitle of Have We All Gone Mad? Um, no prizes for the answer. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very, very much for talking to Thank us about you, it, Jerome. I mean, uh, this is available on Amazon, presumably, yes, and also yep. in bookshops. Yes. Uh, yep. Yeah, and uh, uh, water, your local Waterstones, etc. Um, absolutely well worth checking out. Um, thank you once again and um, maybe come back and tell us if uh, there have been any changes in about a year or so. Love to. Not 30 years, of course. <laughs> not 30. Uh, that's it anyway for this week um, and uh, we shall see you next time. Thank you. Hello. If you're enjoying the New Culture Forum channel and you believe in our mission, may I invite you to join our membership scheme at the link below or on our website, newcultureforum.org.uk. Our work is more important now than ever, and we have great plans ahead for the future, but we can't do it without your support. From as little as £3 per month, you can help ensure that we continue on our mission. As a member, you'll receive a range of benefits, including access to exclusive content, invitations to our private events, including here at our studios, free copies of our books, and much, much more, including, of course, our famous NCF mug. If you aren't able to become a member, then please help us by clicking this button and subscribing to our channel. 
it's completely free. Just remember to also click the bell icon so that you can get notifications when we post new videos. Thank you.